Name, Johnny Messam. Name, Paul Sumner. Why are we doing this together? Well, I've known Paul for a number of years, and uh, we're bringing a collection of stone sculptures here to Melbourne. Why are we having an exhibition of uh, bronze and stone sculpture from London? Well, I think Melbourne audiences love sculpture. It's everywhere in this town, and the timing is right. What's the greatest thing I've ever got from Melbourne? Uh, well, I'd definitely have to say my wife. I'd have to say the same. My wife, I married a Victorian girl too. Could we say anything else? Um, don't think so. <laughs> no. I think, think we said that enough said. Johnny Messam, tell me about this exhibition that you have brought to Melbourne. Well, um, this was just a bit of fun, really, that Paul and I put together uh, a few years back. Uh, I've been coming here for 15 years uh, with my wife and family, and we were thinking of what would be the easiest thing to do, and uh, we've ended up with the hardest, which is three and a half tonnes of stone and bronze uh, um, shipped in over the last few days. And we're jolly glad it arrived in time because there was a moment when uh, it probably wasn't going to be here at all, and, uh, well, Paul and I were brushing up on our cabaret act, so uh, I'm pleased it's here. So tell me, Paul, what do you look like in a pasty? <laughs> Not very good, Libby, actually. I, I, I prefer to sell other people's artwork than consider myself as one. <laughs> Tell me about this new sculpture on the peninsula. Uh, it's amazing. I, I don't know whether you've been down there, Libby, but the, the, the new sculptures that have appeared, I've seen three of them uh, so far, and they're amazing. The, the one that sticks in my mind most of all is the silver tree that moves over. It's, it's amazing. The wind moves it in a kind of beguiling sort of way and, and it's just phenomenal. It's the most incredible work and it's going to become a real icon I think for Melbourne. What has changed in the way people are using their sculpturing techniques that have taken it from being an embodiment or a monument of putting someone in their place in time to living, breathing, gracious artworks, Johnny? I think sculpture has got a little bit of an edge on the uh, two-dimensional art in that sense because it's very tactile. You can really approach it as an object as well as a work of beauty. So I think in that sense it has within it a kinetic life form which people can really respond to. And, and certainly recently now it's, it's a new area, if you like, of art that people are appreciating. And certainly in the time when we've been coming to Australia, I've noticed how perhaps because there are more outdoor pieces of art anyhow, People have sort of have brought that into their own circumstances and looked at what they would like to do in terms of owning a piece or just seeing works around that they can engage with. One of the great things about Australian architecture, Australian lifestyle, is that you infuse the outdoor with the indoor, and that creates a really exciting sort of relationship between objects which exist in the space. I mean, if you went back uh, 30 years, uh, so Eduardo Palozzi said sculpture was a thing you've tripped over when you stepped back to look at a painting. Well, I think now we're looking at art uh, and sculpture as a sort of medium in its own right. And, um, you know, you only have to look at things like Rodin's uh, bronze to know how visceral they are and how relevant they are years and years on. Do people buy them? Do absolutely, they still? Absolutely, they do. This, just this morning we sold the cover the work, this incredible picture of a crouching man in a field, which actually looks a bit like Australia, but it's England. It's, uh, um, and that sold uh, nearly $50,000 to a collector in, in Sydney. And I think sculpture does sell, but it's got to have power and it's got to command you know, the presence. Uh, you're talking about um, European, the history of European sculpture. I think a lot of people, one of the, the, the uh, sculptures people most know is David, you know, the wonderful marble. And that is one of the most iconic artworks uh, in the world, and people relate to it. These artists, these two artists that have come out are exceptional artists, and people come in. If they're taken by it, you know, the checkbook comes out. Who are these two artists, Johnny? They are two guys from the east and west coast of England, Dominic Welsh and Lawrence Edwards. And uh, one works in bronze and the other one's in stone. So it's kind of like a, a yin-yang you know, uh, uh, contrast. What I'm really looking to show is how bronze is a sort of medium which is much more visceral uh, and stone is at work which, because of the nature of how long it takes to create and to carve away is much more contemplative. It has a sort of timeless quality. So hopefully as a contrast, if nothing else, it will show... Uh, the difference between the two mediums. I've often heard sculpture used as a kind of allegory for general creativity, general passion to be creative, and that you've inside every block of marble, you've just got to keep chipping away until you find the horse. Is that the way it is? I think uh, I think that's that's certainly very true. And and it was Barbara Hepworth who said that a sculpture is really a three dimensional projection of a very primal feeling: a touch, a texture, and size, hardness, warmth, and a compulsion to make it come alive. How do you put life in bronze or stone? The sculptures that are on the Anzac Bridge, for instance, in Sydney of the Anzacs, have got such grace, such feeling in them. How do artists put life inside dead material? 
my take on that is probably it's actually the viewer who puts the life into it, if you like. The artist is the conduit. He makes the, the object. But it's how we respond to it that really puts life in. And I think there are two things at work. Sculpture is very fundamental, and it goes back into our ancestry. And we always have a, an inbuilt desire to make things look alive. You can't help look at a still object and make it into a living one. So if you like, there's a kinetic energy in a work of art, sculpture that is, which is always there to be, to be read, uh, if that makes sense. Do you agree, Paul? Yes, it's interesting. That's a very interesting take on on that. Uh, I always think, you know, that everybody is artistic, but only a few people are artists, and they have this kind of indefinable ability to make you respond, I guess, in the way that Johnny's saying. And and it's hard to explain how they can come up with a, a new form and just make, particularly when it's semi-abstract, as one of these uh, artists, these sculptors from England are, it's very hard to explain why what what it is that makes you respond in the way that you do. You just do, and and that's the mark of a, a great artist. Tell me, Johnny, your favourite sculptures. Have you got some that just always make your heart leap when you see them? There's a very very fine uh, Barbara Hepworth, which is in Adelaide at the moment, um, which you can't help but jump at when you see it. But, um, I'm always interested in how people respond to the human form. I think that's a great representation. It's kind of the internal quest. I can't see how it's ever going to be not a question we want to explore. Uh, I, the thing I find most interesting about this whole thing at this particular moment is its relevance to Australia. The history of British art with Australian art, the history of artists from Melbourne going to England and, and studying and then coming back. I know we're in an age now of a sort of Republican thinking, but these links back to the UK and artistic links are incredibly real. And at the end of the day, the, the audiences in the UK and the audiences here in Melbourne, we're actually quite similar, more similar than we might admit. I think now uh, Australian artists have their own vocabulary and it comes a little bit from those historical links to to europe but it's, they've got their own language as i say go to the min, uh, peninsula link go to the east link and have a look at these work these are uh, there's a louise paramore work there that is purely australian it could not have come out of europe um, its references might possibly have links back there but we've got our own voice now in sculpture which is interesting and that's why the show from england is very it's very interesting because we make comparisons and Dame Elizabeth Murdoch, of course, the late Dame Elizabeth Murdoch, had some amazing sculptures at her Cruden farm. Not so much people, but things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the late, great um, Elizabeth Murdoch, what a, what a hero she was for sculpture. As well as collecting herself, she funded the McClellan Gallery in, uh, down on, on the peninsula, uh, which wouldn't exist without her, her support. And, and that's an amazing uh, experience to go for. And in Mel a lot of Melbournians might not have actually gone there go there. And I would just chip in and say from an English point of view, it's a world-class site. So Johnny Messam, this exhibition from your Messam Gallery is here at your gallery, Paul? Yes, at, uh, at Moss Green in Torek Road, South Yarra. So uh, public are very welcome to come along and uh, make their own opinion. Thank you for sharing your secrets, gentlemen. It's been great fun. Thank you.